morning, ladies. It is a delight to see you this morning. And I want to let you know I have two very special guests visiting me this morning. Pam Edmondson and Joni Shankles, would y'all please raise your hands? Yay! They are visiting from Alabama. Um, we served in women's ministry together at Gardendale's First Baptist Church for many years. Went on international mission trips together. The Lord taught us so many wonderful spiritual truths together. And, you know, it's, there's nothing like you have friends, but then you have heart friends that you connect with heart to heart, spirit to spirit. And you raise your children together and you pray with each other through difficult times. And God just knits your heart together. There are two of those people. And Joni is the one that I quote fairly frequently. And um, she had written me this sweet note this morning. And I stuck it in my Bible just because her words are always so precious. It's one of the ways God's gifted her. And she's faithful to use those words to encourage others. And so she had written me this note. And as we were reading or singing, this morning about having a place in the Father's house, I just felt like I needed to share her words because they're not just for me. I think they're for all of us. She said, thank you for opening the doors of your home to make room for me and for Pam to welcome us into your very life. I'm sitting at your table right now, one of my favorite places on earth. Why? Because I belong. And I, as we were singing that, sto that song this morning, I felt like there are women in here this morning that feel like you don't belong. And I want you to know that you do. Not only do you belong, you are loved eternally. You are celebrated and you have a special place, not only in the house of our Father, but in the heart of our Father. And I want you to know that. She said, your table reminds me of the feast to come where love rules and all is made right, where belonging takes on its ultimate meaning in the presence of the King. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, what a precious gift. Thank you, Joni. We're going to be looking this morning as we continue through our study of 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And as we look at verses 1 through 3, we're going to be discussing what it means to really learn how to think like Christ because our minds are impacted by the fall and by our sin nature. And I included on your handout verses 1 through 3 from the message translation. And I want you to listen as I share it with you. Since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more. Okay, so regardless of what's going on in your life right now, regardless of what your current circumstances are, Jesus Christ lived in the flesh so he could experience everything we've experienced, so he could be tempted in every way we are, yet without sin. He could show us how we are to live. He's gone through everything you're going through and more. Learn to think like him. So it's something we must learn to do. It does not come automatic. Think of your sufferings as a weaning from that old sinful habit of always expecting to get your own way. That comes with the sin package, doesn't it? <laughs> then you'll be able to live out your days free to pursue what God wants instead of being tyrannized by what you want. To be tyrannized actually means to be oppressed, tormented, terrorized, bullied. So that's what our sin nature does to us. It bullies us. But we have to come to that point where we say no more and we choose instead to think like Christ. And the only way we can think like Christ, as we know, is to think biblically. 2 Peter 2, 19 says the evil one, the one who's enslaved us by our sin, Promises freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. So we don't want to be enslaved to sin or to the flesh or to the world or to the evil one. We want to choose to be bond slaves of Jesus Christ. And that is a choice. You remember a bond slave was one who had been set free, but because the master was so good to him, he wanted to stay with the master, and they would literally take an owl and A-W-L, and pierce a hole in his ear, which was assigned to everyone he had chosen to remain a bond slave to his master. That is who we are as believers. We are ones who have chosen Jesus Christ as our master. So we are bond slaves, just as Peter would say about himself and Paul would say about himself. We choose to be bond slaves. Do you remember what Mary said when she got the announcement from the angel? What did she say? Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. She should be our example. We also should say, Lord, I'm a bond slave. Be it done to me according to your word. 
And if I'm going to live my life according to the word of God and learn to think like Christ, I must immerse myself in his word, memorize his word, meditate upon his word, study his word, and be encouraged by other believers to live out his word. That is what Jesus Christ has called us to. A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, said, Everything in the universe is good to the degree that it conforms to the nature of God and evil as it fails to do so. Through the work of Christ in atonement, justice is not violated but satisfied when God spares a sinner. Sinner, redemptive theology teaches that mercy does not become effective toward a man until justice has done its work. The just penalty for sin was exacted when Christ, our substitute, died for us on the cross. So the Bible has just told us Jesus Christ died for us, putting to death sin once and for all. So that we, in Christ Jesus, could live victoriously. We could live as Christ lived, think as Christ thought. In fact, Matthew Henry said, the beginning of all true mortification lies in the mind. It's that learning to think like Christ not in penances and hardships upon the body. The mind of man is carnal, full of enmity. The understanding is darkened, being alienated from the life of God. Man is not a sincere creature, but partial, blind, and wicked. Like that description of, our, of us? <laughs> and yet it's true, is it not? Until he's renewed and sanctified by the regenerating grace of God, we're all inherently selfish. We all want our own way. It's what scripture just said. It literally oppresses, it bullies us, that sin nature, until we take it to the cross and we crucify it so that we can come alive in Christ and he literally lives through us. I was talking to my sister this morning. She leads a Bible study on Wednesday evening in Atlanta and it's a cross section of women. I've shared a little bit about it with you before. She has an unbeliever. She has a person Jewish in background. She has all variations of levels of maturity spiritually, but they were all friends through their children growing up and living in a, in a neighborhood together. And so they asked Lisa if she would lead this, lead this Bible study a couple of years ago. And so she, she has been, and they're act, right now studying the New Testament, and tomorrow night's the study of the Holy Spirit. And she said, I know they're going to have a lot of questions about the Holy Spirit. And she said, basically, you know, I know I believe you receive the Holy Spirit the moment you're saved. I said, absolutely, because that's what it means to be born again. You're regenerated. Your spirit, dead to God, is brought back to life, and the Spirit of God comes to live within you. It is not that the Holy Spirit, it's not that you get, need to get more of him, it's that he needs to have more of you. <laughs> you need to surrender yourself so that the Spirit takes over every aspect of your life. So that in, in moments of leisure, your mind automatically goes to him. When you have an opportunity to think about whatever you want to, because your heart's affection is set on Jesus Christ, your mind automatically goes to him, automatically goes to his word, to what he's been teaching you recently. Hebrews 9.28 tells us, Christ's first appearing was to deal with sin. His second coming will be to bring salvation to his followers. Having done away with sin, his purpose was accomplished. I know because of the country we live in, we understand that prosperity is a greater curse than adversity. And we know that biblically as well, because we've seen sin cycles throughout Scripture as we watch and look at God's people in the Old Testament, particularly in the period of the judges, but also in the period of the kings. We see how they would turn toward pagan idolatry. Their hearts are bent toward sin, bent toward moving away from God and rebelling under him. But when adversity would strike, when an army would come against them, what do they do immediately? They cry out to God, right? They turn back to the Lord because they recognize their inability to protect themselves from the enemy. We too are not able to protect ourselves. We have a very real enemy. And it is in times of difficulty and struggle that we most often hear his voice most clearly that we are most desperate to get into his word, that we are serious about our prayer time. And those are the times that we grow the most. Oh, that we would learn from that and not have to go through difficulties to turn us back to the Lord and to turn our hearts back to him, but that we would cling to him. So what happens? These people are getting saved and they're recognizing that Jesus Christ died to sin once and for all so they could live victoriously, no longer enslaved to sin. And we move into uh, verse 4, and what are the, their pagan friends? What's happening now? Look at verse 4. In all of this, they are surprised that you don't run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For the gospel has for this purpose been preached even to those who are now dead, that though they are judged in the flesh as men, they may live in the spirit according to the will of God. 
So we know that the pagan response to us living for Jesus Christ is one of not understanding. They don't get it. They will malign us and think that we're holier than thou or that we're trying to live legalistically when in reality we've been set free. It's what we sang about this morning. We're no longer enslaved to sin. We're no longer seeking to have legitimate needs met in illegitimate ways. We now have our need for love and significance met in a personal, intimate relationship with God the Father through His Son, empowered by the Spirit. So we no longer need the things of this earth, and they really do grow strangely dim in light of His glory and grace. The more clearly we see Christ as he is revealed to us through his word, the less the world appeals to us. Peter's assumption is that those who slander Christians for their changed change lifestyle are in effect, in effect slandering or blaspheming God himself, the one who called these new believers out of darkness into his marvelous light. Whatever is done to or for a child of God is done to or for God himself. We know that. Jesus himself taught that in Matthew 25 when he said, whatever you do to the least of these, what? You've done it unto me. So as we serve, as we care for, as we serve in the church, we're literally doing it unto Christ. As we serve our families, we're doing it unto Christ. As we love our neighbor, we're doing it unto Christ. But if we are maligned, we don't have to defend ourselves because they are actually maligning, blaspheming God himself. And he is able to defend us. He is our defender. You know, we can't expect the lost to understand these things. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4, it says, The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. In fact, we read last week that we're not to return, uh, you know, not to revile and return, but instead we're to speak a blessing, right? So we don't do what comes natural to our natural man when somebody's maligning or reviling us. Instead, we pray for them, and we choose to bless them. Because even if we try to explain to them, and I do believe we need to give a, a defense for the hope that we have, but we cannot expect them to get it until they come to that place of faith and belief in Jesus Christ. And at that moment, the Spirit of God grants them understanding and discernment. But you cannot understand the things of the Spirit, but the Bible says, until you are a spiritual being, until you've been regenerated, you've come back to life in the Spirit, because these things are spiritually appraised. So without the Spirit of God, you don't get it. It doesn't make sense. And it explains why sometimes when you try to explain a spiritual truth to someone who is either carnal, a believer but not living and walking in the Spirit, or who is lost, it's like it just goes over their head. They don't get it. It's not important to you. And it is so clear. I mean, you just, it is so exciting to you. And you, you're so excited and pumped about this new revelation God's given you. And they don't get it. But if they're lost, they can't. It's not that they don't want to. What does the Bible just say? They cannot. They cannot understand the things of the Spirit because they're spiritually appraised. So we're not, we've got to understand we cannot be bound by man's opinion of us. And we see that here. They may malign you. They may question your motives. But we live for Christ alone. Colossians 3 says, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed. And we, he is our life. He is to be our life. So as, if he is our life, we don't, we're not concerned about what other people think. We love them. We share the truth with them. We pray for them. We care for them. We have compassion upon them. But we cannot allow them to define us. We cannot allow what they think of us to change who we know we are because we're in Christ Jesus. We have to know who we are in Christ. And for me, that truth was fleshed out in response to fear. And I've shared with you guys before that I literally could not have done what I'm doing the first 10 years that Steve and I were married. I couldn't even read scripture in a group of adults without having a panic attack. And as I began to pray through and God brought godly women, mentors into my life who prayed with me and helped me face that and recognize that it was sin and that I had set up unrealistic boundaries that absolutely literally made no sense because sin is irrational and it causes you to do things that are irrational. I had set up boundaries where I thought I was safe when in reality I was not safe because I was not in the center of God's will. I was trusting Donna's boundaries and my protection is to the gods. And when I got to the end of it, what was it? At the root, it was pride. It was pride because I obviously cared more about what the people around me thought. And it was because I had placed unrealistic expectations upon myself as a pastor's wife that I felt inadequate. So consequently, pride took over and I just decided, well, I just don't do adults. I'll just do children because I feel more comfortable. I feel safer with children. But God was calling me to teach women and I did not realize it at the time. 
But when I finally said, yes, Lord, I'll do whatever you ask me to do, he gave me victory over fear. We don't get the victory until we say yes in faith. He doesn't relieve whatever it is you're struggling with, the anxiety, the worry, the whatever it may be. He's not going to give you victory from that until you step out in faith when you don't know how he's going to do it and just say yes. And then he gives you the power through his spirit to overcome. That's what he's talking about right here in this passage of scripture. And if we will turn from man's opinion to God's opinion, we'll be shocked at the peace that will prevail in our hearts and minds. Anxious thoughts will be taken captive and refused entrance. And we will be given rest in him and in his perfect will. So we've been changed. We belong to Jesus Christ. We're learning to think as he thinks. And people are not going to understand. People in the world are not going to understand our value system, why we live the way we live. But it doesn't matter because we know there's more to come. We know that Jesus Christ is coming back. And because of that, let's look at our next verses, 7 through 11. The end of all things is is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for what? The purpose of prayer. Be sober, be alert, be on guard for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we are to live expectantly. Because as we discussed, Jesus Christ came the first time to do away with sin. He comes the next time to conquer the evil one. He comes the next time to redeem us, to take us home to that place that he has prepared for us. And we are to live in expectation of seeing him. And we will see him either in the rapture or as we enter his presence through the doorway of death. As Warren Wiersbe says, the important thing is that we shall see the Lord one day and stand before him. How we live and serve today will determine how we are judged and rewarded on that day. Which is why for me, my refrain has become, live every day for that day. Live every day for that day. So every day I acknowledge that this new day is a gift from the hand of the Lord. And I ask him to fill me and use me and to ordain my steps to go before me and prepare the way for me and to use me to fulfill his purpose and plan for my life for this day. And I want to be in tune with him as I walk through that day. Peter outlines how we're to live in relationship now with other believers. You know, he told us how we're to behave with non-believers when they don't understand, but now he's saying this is how you're to love one another. This is what the body of Christ is supposed to look like and how we're to care for one another. We know the foundation of our spiritual life is the word of God and prayer. In fact, as we devote ourselves to prayer, The life of love that we are commanded to live will flow out of us to the degree that we have surrendered to Christ and crucified the flesh. Now let's think on that one one more time. As we devote ourselves to prayer, which you can't pray if you haven't crucified the flesh, if you haven't offered yourself on the altar and really want to be in tune with the Lord, that's how we pray. We've got to get in tune with his spirit to really pray and to connect with him through prayer. So as we devote ourselves to prayer, the life of love we are commanded to live literally flows out of us through his spirit to the degree that we have surrendered to Christ and crucified our flesh. So we are to be sober in prayer. One of the Things that um, Joni and Pam and Dane and I have enjoyed doing through the years is reading books because we all love to read. And we all got on this kick this past year of reading Dallas Willard. Well, last night, as we were sitting around talking at home and talking about what the Lord had been speaking to us recently and praying together, um, Joni mentioned some quotes from The Spirit of the Disciplines by Dallas Willard. And as I picked it back up this morning and looked at it, I thought this fits perfectly with what we're talking about today. He said the modern age is an age of revolution, revolution motivated by insight into the appalling vastness of human suffering and need. Pleas for holiness and attacks on sin and Satan were used for centuries as the guide and the cure for the human situation. 
Today, such pleas have been replaced with a new agenda. On the communal level, political and social critiques yield recipes for revolutions meant to liberate humankind from its many bondages. And on the individual level, various self-fulfillment techniques promise personal revolutions bringing freedom in an unfree world and passage into the good life. Such are modern answers to humanity's woes. But against this background, a few voices have continued to emphasize that the cause of the distressed human condition, individual and social, and its only possible cure is a spiritual one. But what these voices are saying is not clear. They point out that social and political revolutions have shown no tendency to transform the heart of darkness that lies deep in the breast of every human being. That's evidently true. And amid a flood of techniques for self-fulfillment, there's an epidemic and it's going on in our day, and it is skyrocketing, of depression, suicide, personal emptiness, and escapism through drugs and alcohol, cultic obsession, consumerism, and sex and violence, all combined with an inability to sustain deep and enduring personal relationships. And yet we know that the enemy wants to keep us away from the Word of God because the only hope for mankind is right here. It is in the word of God in the person of Jesus Christ. And so he goes on to say, we can become like Christ in character and in power and thus realize our highest ideals of well-being and well-doing. That is the heart of the New Testament. And we come to think like Christ through discipleship, through the disciplines of spending time every day in the Word of God. Because we have a bent towards sin, we have to be rebent, don't we? <laughs> we are bent to go our own way. We have to subdue that will. We have to crucify it, take it to the cross on a daily basis so that we are bent toward the Lord and His will and not our own will. And it is an act of our will to choose Christ above all, which means I must set the alarm clock to be able to get up in the morning to spend time in God's word and to have time in prayer. I have to be disciplined to do it whether I feel like it or not because the enemy can hijack my feelings to keep me out of God's word. And when I'm out of God's word and not connected to him through his spirit, that means that day I'm walking in the flesh and I am open to the wiles and the schemes of the evil one. It is only after I have submitted myself to Christ and I go out into my day in tune with his spirit that I am alert to the schemes of the enemy and the traps that he has set, but also that I'm in tune to be used by him to be a blessing to others, to come alongside and be aware when a divine appointment occurs, that I have someone God has allowed to cross my path that I am to be a blessing to, that I am to help, maybe that I'm to give something to, that I am to love in the way that Christ loves me. So he goes on to tell us, okay, here's what it's to look like as you love on each other. He said, be sober in prayer. And Warren Wearsby said the word watch, to watch in prayer, carries with it the idea of alertness and self-control. It's the opposite of being drunk or asleep. This admonition had special meaning to Peter. Now think about it, why? Because he went to sleep when he should have been watching unto prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. So you can see now why he is so diligent to say, you must be alert. You must be watchful in prayer. Because it is as we pray that we're connected to the Lord, spirit to spirit. And he begins to reveal truth to us, but he also reveals to us his purpose for our life and the things that he has for us to accomplish in his name. And so as we pray, then we're to be loving. We're to love one another. We're to be known by our love for one another. This love is not based on feeling. But on an act of the will, as we choose to love, our feelings will eventually line up with our actions. We know that. As stated in the Expositor's Bible com Commentary, he said, Agape love is capable of being commanded because it is not primarily an emotion, but a decision of the will leading to action. And it is agape love that we have experienced in Christ. It's the agape love of the Father who while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were at our least lovely and lovable, Jesus Christ died for us. And so we are to give that same kind of agape love to one another. And as we love each other and we celebrate the uniqueness and the giftings of our brothers and sisters in Christ, we are unified. 
And God grants us that one heart and one spirit in Christ Jesus, and we become a healthy body of Christ that he is able to entrust with true riches, which are spiritual, and he is able to then now empower us to be used by him to do what only he can accomplish because we have crucified the flesh and we are choosing to live for him. And we are more powerful together than we will ever be separately. God has chosen to pour himself out upon his body. So we are to love one another and we're to be hospitable with a cheerful heart, without grumbling as serving the Lord, because we are simply stewards. Steve and I had a really fun experience this past week. Um, I was not here last Tuesday because we were in Nashville at a Dave Ramsey Stewardship Summit. And this is a summit that Dave's company invites pastors and wives from across the United States, from some of the larger churches. In fact, Bellevue was one of the smallest churches represented there, if that tells you anything. <laughs> um, they're all denominations, and it's really fun to get to get to know pastors and their wives from other places in the United States, but also from other denominations, and to see how really similar we actually really are. And so we were actually sitting one night at dinner with the stewardship pastor from um, Saddleback, Rick Warren's church out in California. He and his wife, and his wife is a precious student of the word and Bible teacher at Saddleback. And of course, she and I were exchanging books and notes and, and just really, really connected. And I and so thoroughly enjoyed getting to know her. But he shared an illustration because he said he's always doing stewardship things. And so when you think about hospitality, and we talked about it when we did Home Builders, hospitality is about having an open life and an open home because we're simply stewards of whatever God has entrusted us with, and it's all to be used for his kingdom. None of it really belongs to us. And he said, so there's this really great example that he likes to use. And I'm going to pick on Linda Dawkins. Let's say that Linda Dawkins' car broke down. And so we're at church at Bible study, and her car's broken down, and so I, we Somebody comes and tows her car, and it's going to be fixed. And I say, you know what, Linda, I can ride with Steve. He's here today. I'm going to give you the keys to my car, and you may drive my car until your car is fixed. Well, next week at Bible study, she drives my car to Bible study, and her car has been fixed. And she says, well, you know, I have the keys, and if you would like to use my car, I'm happy for you to. I go, no, wait a minute. That is my car. I just allowed you to use my car until your car is fixed. And she goes, oh, no, I have the keys. <laughs> I have the keys. This car belongs to me now. Okay, that's about as ludicrous as me saying that the money that God has allowed us to have is mine or that the home that he has allowed us to live in is mine. Who gave it to me? Who gives me the very breath to breathe? <laughs> the Lord does. It, nothing belongs to me. I am here. I don't belong to this earth. I am a citizen of heaven. I am a sojourner. I am passing through. I'm on a journey. And so I hold everything lightly. And whatever I have belongs to the Lord. And if we will view life that way, what is amazing is you really cannot outgive God. As you start giving it away to be used in his kingdom, he pours out more on you so that you can give more away. Because what are we to be? a channel, a vessel of honor in his hand. One of my favorite pictures in scripture is Mary of Bethany anointing the feet of Jesus. And I love it because she got that he was going to the cross. And so she did the most extravagant thing she knew to do. She took that precious ointment worth a year's wages and she broke it and she anointed his head and his feet. And Jesus knew that she knew because he knows our very thoughts and knows our heart. He knew that she knew he was going to the cross and he commended her for that. He defended her and he commended her. She's preparing my body for burial. She knew it. Even though the disciples refused to believe it, she knew. And I love that because what did she do? She poured herself out as she poured out that ointment. And that's how I like to envision when I'm giving things away, I am pouring myself out on Jesus. I am saying, Lord Jesus, I love you as I serve someone. I'm saying, Lord Jesus, I love you as I tutor a child in the inner city. I'm saying, Lord Jesus, I love you as I come alongside a single mother. I'm saying, Jesus, I love you as I disciple women in the word of God. I'm saying, Jesus, I love you as I serve my family, as I cook a meal, as I scrub potties, or whatever it is I do. I'm serving Jesus Christ. What do we say? When you do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. So there really is no mundane, is there? Everything is holy. Everything is holy. When it's done as unto the Lord we give it back to as a gift to him. And say, so God, I don't even, I don't, not only do I not own anything, I don't own myself. I have no control over my next breath or the beat of my heart. Only you do. And God knows that my days are numbered. So consequently, I have no fear. I can do whatever it is he's called me to do, live wherever he wants me to live, serve wherever he wants me to serve without fear because he is with me. He is with me and he will not leave me. And whatever he calls me to do, he is more than able 
to do through me. And that's the only thing, way anything gets accomplished anyway. Because apart from him, it's impossible. We can do nothing. Nothing of eternal value apart from him. So we're to be hospitable. We're to open our homes and open our lives. <clears throat> in fact, I pulled back two quotes from uh, when we did hospitality and home builders, because I like these two especially. In a culture where busyness is prized, where isolation is rampant, and where blinking devices replace genuine relationships, hospitality offers a beautiful and countercultural rebellion. One of the most countercultural things you can do is have an entire conversation with someone without checking your phone. <laughs> From the simplest way to change the world, biblical hospitality is a way of life. And then from Karen Main's book, Open Heart, Open Home, she said, the difference between entertaining and hospitality. Entertaining says, I want to impress you with my beautiful home, my clever decorating, my gourmet cooking. Hospitality, however, seeks to minister. It says, this home is not mine. It is truly a gift from my master. I am his servant, and I use it as he desires. Hospitality does not try to impress, but to serve. And it changes everything. It changes our perspective when we take it off of what will they think of me to how can I love and serve the people I'm opening my life to and opening my home to. So we are to be a servant. It goes on then to tell us that we're to serve with the gift or gifts God has given us. And when you're saved, not only does the Spirit of God come to live within you, but the Holy Spirit gifts you according to the will of God. And so you're given a gift for the benefit of the body. And that is the way God has created us to be connected to one another, to be interlocked, to be the very body of Christ to a lost and hurting world. And when they look at us, they should marvel at our love for the Lord and our love for one another, our genuine care for each other. So we need to love each other and we need to be servants to each other with the gifts God has given us, building up the church. And all of our lives should be a doxology to the Lord. I love that Peter closes this section with a doxology. He just breaks out into praise. So that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And so when I think about offering my life as a doxology, as a praise to the Lord, I think about some of the things we're desiring to do that God has led us to as a church like Jesus loves Memphis this Saturday we can all participate it's an opportunity for us to serve our city and to take the love of Christ into the city to love those who don't know Christ to love other fellow members of the body who need additional resources need us to come alongside them to really love Memphis like it matters, which is what we're going to be focusing on with our upcoming love offering. I'm so excited about the opportunity to be able to do that, to come alongside others within the city, other churches that we already partner with, that we're going to come alongside and make like a three-year commitment to, to provide them with resources and ministerial assistance to help them reach their communities with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's who God has called us to be. And when we start living like that, you better believe a lost world is going to take notice. You better believe they will. Katie Davis, in her book, Kisses from Katie, said, I will not change the world. Jesus will do that. I can, however, let him use me to change the world for one person. And out of that, my heart is that as believers, we would each desire each one to love one. I may not be able to reach every child in the city, but I can sure love one. I may not be able to reach every single mother in the city, but I can sure come alongside one, and I can pray with her and pray for her and do what I can for them to help to come alongside them, to encourage them, to help children with homework, to help them with some of the basic necessities of life. I can do that for one. And I think sometimes we look out at the world or even our city where 44.7% of children are currently living in poverty, and we think that's overwhelming, I can't do anything. Well, no, we can't turn the whole thing around overnight, but if each one of us loved one, the entire city could be turned upside down with the love of Jesus Christ. And that's what God has called us to. He's called us to think like Christ, to get in on what he's doing and to be used by him that our lives might be a doxology, a beautiful song of praise to our Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Lord, our, our hearts are just overwhelmed when we ponder your goodness, that you have given us in Christ everything we need for life and godliness 
that through the power of your spirit, we literally can learn to think like Jesus. We can take our thoughts captive in the power of your spirit and replace, replace lies with truth. And Lord, once again, I just want to revisit for the woman who is in here today thinking she does not belong. God, that you would let her know how loved she is. And precious, precious sister, hear from me. Not only do you belong, you are celebrated. You are greatly loved and delighted in. Do not listen to the voice of the evil one. He is stealing your identity. He is stealing the power the Father has given you through his spirit. Proclaim today, I am a child of God. And everything, everything that Christ Jesus has now belongs to me because I am in Christ. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are good. And thank you that even when the circumstances of our life and suffering come in and it seeks to drown out your voice, we thank you that the truth we have within wells up and speaks truth to our heart and to our mind. And we know, regardless of what the enemy says, regardless of what our circumstances say, that you are good and you will take everything the enemy has meant for evil in our lives and turn it into good. Our good and your glory. So whoever's walking through a valley right now, press in. Cling to Jesus. He is faithful. He is sure. He is your rock upon which you can build your life. Father, thank you for every woman in this room. Thank you that you have connected us in your spirit. And Lord, I'm asking you to fill us and unleash us to pray and love and serve and welcome others into our lives with the gospel of our Lord and Savior. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ladies, if you have not gotten your ticket yet for Amy Hannon, you're going to miss out. It's